from around the globe, it's theCUBE, with digital coverage of AWS reInvent 2020, sponsored by Intel, AWS, and our community partners. Hello and welcome back to theCUBE's live coverage for AWS reInvent 2020. I'm John Furrier with theCUBE, your host. We are theCUBE virtual, we're not there in person this year, we're remote with the pandemic and we're here for the keynote analysis for Werner Vogels, and we got some great analysts on and friends of theCUBE, CUBE alumni, Rob Hirschfeld is the founder and CEO of RackN, a pioneer in the DevOps space, as well as early on on the bare metal, getting on the whole on-premise, he's seen the vision. And I can tell you, I've talked to him many times over the years, he's been on the same track, he's on the right wave. Rob, great to have you on. I'm going to have Sarp Beach come on, you all come on as well, but great to see you. Thanks, pleasure to be here. Um, so the keynote uh, with Werner was, you know, he's like takes you on a journey, you know, it's, and, and virtual is actually a little bit different vibe, but I thought they did an exceptional job of stage layout and some of the virtual stage craft. Um, but yeah. what I really enjoyed the most was really this next level thinking around systems thinking, right? Which is my favorite topic because, you know, we've been saying going back 10 years, the cloud is just to hear the computer, right? It's operating system. And so, um, this is the big theme. This is, what's your reaction to the keynote? Wow, so I, I think you're right. This is one of the challenges with what Amazon has been building is it's, you know, it is a lock box, it's a service. So you don't, you don't get to see behind the scenes. You don't really get to know how they run these services. And what, what I see happening out of all of those pieces is they've really come back and said, we need to help people operate this platform. And, and that shouldn't be surprising to anyone, right? The last couple of years, they've been rolling out service, 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 all these new things. This talk was really different for Werner's normal ones because he wasn't talking about whiz bang new technologies. Um, he was really talking about operations. Um, you know, died in the wool, how do we make the system easier to use? How do we expose things? What assistance can we have in, in building applications? Uh, in some cases, it felt like uh, an application performance monitoring or management APM talk from five or even 10 years ago. Um, canaries, um, you know, canary deployments, chaos engineering, observability, uh, sort of bread and butter operational things. We have Sabi Joal, who's an influencer, cloud computing extraordinaire, DevOps guru, uh, we don't need DevOps guru from Amazon. We got Sarbeet and uh, <laughs> Rob here. So it'd be great to see you. Um, you guys had a watch party. Um, tell me what the reaction was um, with some of the influencers in the cloud or audio out there that were looking at Verna's announcement because this does attract a tech crowd. What was your take and what was the conversation like? Yeah, we kind of geeked out um, and we, we had a watch party and we were commenting back and forth uh, like when we were watching it. I think the the general consensus is that the com complexity of AWS uh, stack itself is is increasing, right? And they have been focused on developers a lot, I think a lot longer than they needed to be a little bit, I think. Uh, now they need to focus on the operations. And like we, we, all, we all love DevOps talks and it's very fancy and it's a very modern way of building software. But if you think deep down, that like once we develop software traditionally and, and also going forward, I think we need to have that separation. Once you develop something, it's in, in production, it's, it's, it's operating, right? Once you build a car, you're operating car. You're not building car all the time, right? So same with the software. Once you build a system, it should have some stability where you're running it, operating it for, for a while, at least before you touch it or refactor and all that stuff. So I think like building and operating at the same time, it's very good for companies like Amazon, AWS, especially, uh, and and Google and 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 Facebook and all those folks who are building technology um, because they're purely high tech companies, but not for GM, Ford, Chrysler, or or Kaiser Permanente, and which is healthcare or or a school district. Like they they need need to operate that stuff once it's built. So I think the, uh, the operationalization of cl cloud uh, will, I think, take focus going forward a lot more than it has. And observability, and on a funny note, I said observability is one of those things right now these days, like, like you know, in the beauty pageants, every 
uh, contestant says like whatever question you ask, they say da da da, and they answer it and say at the end world peace, right? Yeah. And that's a world peace, right? A term which is the uh, observability. Like you can talk about all the tech stuff and all the stuff, and at the end you say observability, and and you you'll be fine. So um, what I'm making is like observability is and was very important. And then what what Warner was talking today about like how we can enable the building of observability into this new paradigm, which is the microservices, like where you pass the service ID uh, all across all the functions from beginning to the end, right? And so, so you can trace stuff. So I think he was talking uh, at that well, let level. Let me ask you, let me, let's dig into observability real quick. I have a couple of other points I want to get your opinions on. Mm -hmm. He said, quote, there's three enabling, major enabling technologies powering observability, metrics, logging, and tracing. Yeah. We know that what that is, of course. But he, he almost didn't take a position. If you look at all the startups out there that are saying they're the next observability, there's at least six that I know of. I mean, that are saying, and then you mm -hmm. got ones that are kind of come in. Uh, I think Signal FX was one I liked, like I got bought by Splunk. And then is observability um, a feature um, or is it a company? I mean, this is something that kind of gets talked about, right? I mean, is, I mean, is it, <laughs> really something you can build a business on or is it a white space that's a feature that gets pulled in? What's your guys reaction to that? So I, this is a platform conversation. And, and you know, one of the things that we've been having conversations around recently is this idea of platforms. And, and you know, I've been doing a lot of work on infrastructure as code and distributed infrastructure and how people want infrastructure to be more code-like, which is very much what, what Werner was, was saying, right? How do we bring development process capabilities into our infrastructure operations? Um, and these are platform challenges. What, what you're asking about from observability's perspective is if I'm running my code in a platform, if I'm running my infrastructure as a platform, I actually need to understand what that platform is doing and how it's making actions. Um, that today we haven't really built the platforms to be very transparent to the users. And observability becomes this necessary component to fix all the platforms that we have, whether they're Kubernetes or AWS, or you know, even going back to VMware or bare metal. If you can't see what's going on, then you're operating in the blind. And, and that is an increasingly big problem as we get more and more sophisticated infrastructure, right? Amazon's outage was based you know, on systems can, being very connected together and we keep connecting systems together. And so we have to be able to diagnose and troubleshoot when those connections break. Or if we're using containers or lambdas, the code that's running is ephemeral. It's only around for short periods of time. And if something's going wrong in it, it's yeah. incredibly hard and, to figure and Rob, out. You know, and, and also he, you know, he reiterated his whole notion of log everything. Right, he kept on banging on the drum on that one, like log everything, which is actually good practice. You got to log everything. Why wouldn't you? I mean, uh, you do, but they don't make it easy, right? Amazon has not made it easy to cross, cross and uh, connect all the data across all of those platforms, right? People think of Amazon as one thing, but you know, the people, us, we, we who are using it understand it's actually a collection of services. And some of those are not particularly that tied together. So figuring out something that's going on across across all of your service bundles. And this isn't an Amazon problem. This is an industry challenge, especially as we go towards microservices. I have to be able to figure out what happened even if I used 10 services. Yeah, it's the classic it's horizontal scalability argument. Sorry, I want to get your thoughts on this. So the observability, uh, he also mentioned systems theory. He kind of couched it before he went into the talk about systems theory. I'm like, okay, let's, I, I mean, I love systems and I think that's going to be the big you know, a wake up call here for the next 10 years. It's a systems mindset. And I think, you know, um, Rob's right. It's a platform conversation when you're thinking about an operating system or a system. It has consequences when things change, but he talked about controllability versus uh, observability and kind of teed, teed up the, well, you can control, have systems controls, or you can have observability. Uh, what's he getting at in all of this? What's he trying to say? Keep. You know, it was, is it a cover story? Is it, is it, a, is it a feature? What was he, what was Werner getting at with all this? Uh, I, I, I believe they, they understand that, that, uh, that all these services are very, very sort of micro in nature from Amazon itself, right? And then they are not tied together as, as Rob said earlier. And, and they, he addressed that. He, he, he uh, announced a service. I don't know the name of that right now off the top of my head, 
that we will gather all the data from all the different places, and then you can take a look at all the data coming from different services at this at, the, at one place where you have the service ID passed on to all the services. You have to do that. It's it's a discipline as a software developer. You have to sort of adhere to even in traditional world, like like you know, like how you do logging and and monitoring and tracing. Um, it, it's it's your creativity at play, right? So that's what software is. So like if you can pass on, I, I, I was tweeting, but they, they give an example of uh, Citrix. Uh, when, when when you are using like tons of applications which are streamed to your desktop through Citrix, they had app ID concept, right? So you can trace what you're using and all that stuff and they can trace the usage and all that stuff. And they can, they can uh, map that log to that application, to that user. So you need that. So I think he he was talking about that. I think that's what he's getting to. Like we have to, we have to sort of rethink how we write software in this new Microsoft uh, sort of a paradigm, which I believe it, it's beautiful thing uh, as long as we can manage it because Microsofts are spread across like um they're small and a smaller piece of software everywhere, right? So the the state, how do we keep state intact? How do we um, sort of trace things, uh, it, it becomes a huge problem if we don't do it right. So it, it, it's, um, it's a little, there's some learning curve for most of the developers out there. I've Where does 60, it crash? 70 Rob, Rob was bringing this up. <laughs> yeah. I want to get into this whole crash and what is it kind of break down? Because you know, there's a point where you don't have the nirvana of true horizontal scalability, where you might have yeah. microservices that need to traverse boundaries or systems boundaries where, or silos. So to Rob's point That's earlier, right. If you don't see it, you can't measure it, or you can't get through it. How do you wire services across boundaries? Is that containers? Is that? I mean, how does this all? How do you guys see that working? I just see a train wreck there. It's it's a really hard problem, and I, I don't think we should underestimate it because everything we just talked about sounds great if you're in a single AWS region. We're talking about distributed infrastructure, right? If you think about what we've been seeing even more generally about you know edge sites, uh, colo, on-prem, you know, in-cloud, multi-region cloud, all these things are actually taking this one concept and you're like, oh, I just want to store all the log data. Now you're, you're not going to store all your log data in one central location anymore. That in itself is a distributed infrastructure problem where I have to be able to troubleshoot what's going on, you know, and know that the logs are going to the right place and capture the data that's really important. Um, and one of the innovations in this that I think is going to impact the industry over the next couple of years is the addition of more artificial intelligence and machine learning into understanding operations patterns and practices. And I, I think that that's a really significant industry trend where Amazon has a distinct advantage because it's their systems and it's captive. They can analyze and collect a lot of data across very many customers and learn from those things and program systems that learn from those things. Um, and so the way you're going to keep up with this is not by logging more and more data, but by doing exactly what Werner, Werner was, was talking through, which was yeah. how do I analyze the patterns with machine learning so that I can get predictive analysis so that I can understand something that looks wrong and then put people on checking it before it goes wrong. All right, um, I got I to gotta bring up something controversial. I can't hold back please. any longer. Um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg said many, many years ago, Oh, all the old people, they can't do startups. They're too old and you got to be young and hungry. You got to do that stuff. If we're talking systems theory, uh, automated meta reasoning, evolvable systems, resilience, distributed computing, isn't that us old guys that have actually have systems experience? I mean, if you're under mm -hmm. the age of 30, you probably don't even know what a system is um, and or co coded to the level of systems that we used to code. And I'm putting my quote old mm -hmm. man kind of theory out, only kidding by the way, under 30. But my point is there is a generation of us that had done computer science in the in the 80s and late 70s, maybe 80s and 90s. It's all it was was systems. It was a systems world. Now you had That's a right. software world, the aperture's increasing in terms of software. Are the younger generation of developers system thinkers or have we lost that art? Um, or is, is it, does it matter? What do you guys think? I, I think systems thinking comes with age. I mean, that, that's, that's what, how I think. I mean, like I'm, I take the systems thinking into like greater sort of um, 
world, like um, state is a system, country is a system, and everything is a system. Your body is a system, family is a system. So it's the same way. And then what impacts that system when you operate it? Internal things, which happen within the system and external, right? And we usually don't talk about the economics and, and, and the geopolitical about the technology, sometimes we do. Like we, I think we need to talk more about that—the data sovereignty and all that stuff. But, but even within the system, I think the, the younger people appreciate it less because they don't have they, they don't see um, software taught like that in the universities and 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 and, and by, by these micro micro universities now online training school and stuff. Like it's very like okay, you learn this thing and you're good at this thing. No, 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 it's not like that. So you got to understand the basics. And how the systems operate. Uh, I'll give you an example. So, like we were doing the 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 client server in in early '90s, and then gradually we moved, morphed towards like having ESB enterprise services bus, where you pass the state uh, from one object to another, and they, we we can bring in the heterogeneous sort of languages. This thing is written in Java. This is in .NET. This is in Python, and then you can pass it through that. Uh, you can make it stateful, right? And that that was contained environment. Like ESBs were contained environment. We were I, I wrote software for ESBs <laughs> myself at Commerce One. And so like we what we need today is the ESP equivalent in the cloud. We don't have that. Rob, is there reverse ageism and, going and on much, with, uh, with developers? I mean, if you're young, you might not have uh, well, the juice to do systems. What do you think? I, I don't agree with that. I, I actually think that the nature of the systems that we're programming forces people into more distributed infrastructure thinking. The platforms we have today are much better than they were you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, um, in the sense that I can do distributed infrastructure programming without thinking about it very much anymore. But you know, people know, know how to use cloud, they know how to use a big platform, they know how to break things into microservices. I, I think that these are inherent skills that people need to think about. The, the, you're, you're right, there is a challenge in that, you know, you get very used to the platform doing the work for you and that you need to break through it. But that's an experiential thing, right? The more experienced developers are going to have to understand what the platforms do. Just like, you know, we used to have to understand how registers worked inside of a CPU, something I haven't worried about for a long, long time. So I, I don't think it's that big of a problem um, from, from that perspective, I do think that the thing that's really hard is collaboration. And so, you know, it's, it's hard people to people, it's hard inside of a platform, it's hard when you're at Amazon size and you've been rolling out services all over the place and now have to figure out how to fit them all together. Um, and that to me is, is a design problem and it's more about being patient and letting things uh, mature. If anything, my takeaway from this keynote is you know, everybody asked Amazon to take a breath and work on usability and, and cross cross services synchronizations rather than, than adding more services into the mix. And that's yeah, I mean, it's a of, good point. I mean, again, I bring up the conversation because it's kind of the elephant in the room and I mean, you know, being controversial to make a point there, sorry, because, you know, I, I interviewed Judy Estrin who helped found the internet with Vin Cerf. She's well known for her contributions for the TCP IP protocol. Andy Bechtenstein, who's the, who's the Rembrandt of motherboards, as Pat Gelsinger, CEO of VMware would say, both said to me on theCUBE that without systems thinking, you don't understand consequences of when things change. And when you start thinking about this microservices conversation, you start to hear a little bit of that pattern emerging where those systems uh, designs matter. And then you have, on the other hand, mm -hmm. you have this modern application framework where serverless takes over. So, you know, Rob, back to your infrastructure as code, it really isn't an either or, they're not mutually exclusive. You're going to have a set of nerds and geeks engineering systems uh, to make them better and easier and, and yeah. scalable. And then you're going to have application developers that need to just make it work. So you start to see the formation of kind of the, I won't say swim lanes, but I mean, what do you guys think about that? Because you know, Judy well, and, and um, Andy Bessensheimer, they're kind of right. Um, the, the, the enemy here, and we're seeing this over and over again is complexity. And, and the challenge has been, and serverless is like this. People are like, oh, I don't have to worry about servers anymore because I'm dealing with serverless, which is not true. What you're doing is you're not worrying about infrastructure as much, but you, the complexity, especially in a serverless infrastructure where you're pulling you know, events from all sorts of things and you have one, one action, one piece of code you know, 
triggering a whole bunch of other pieces of code in a decoupled way. We are, we are bringing so much complexity into these systems um, that they're very hard to conceive of. Um, and AIML is not going not gonna to address yeah. that. Um, I think one of the things that was wonderful about the setting uh, in the sugar factory and, and all of that, you know, sort of very mechanical viewpoint, you know, when you're actually connecting all things together, you can see it. Uh, a lot of what we've been building today is almost impossible to observe. And so the complexity price that we're paying in infrastructure is going up exponentially. And we can't sustain infrastructures like that. We have to start leveling that. Great that point on the curve. keynote, by the way, great call out on, on, the, on the setting. I thought that was very clever. Sarvji, what do you think about this? Because as enterprises go through this transformation, one of the big conversations is the solution architecture, the architecture of um, how you lay all this out because there's complexity involved. Now you got on-premises and you got cloud, you got edge which you're hearing more and more local processing, disconnected systems, managing it at the edge with visualization. We're going to hear more about that uh, with Dirk when he comes on the queue, but you know, just in general, as a practitioner out there, what, what's, what's your, what do you see people getting their arms around, around this, this keynote? What are they, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I, I think uh, the, the pattern I see emerging is like, or, or in the whole industry, right, regardless, like if you put vendors aside, is that like we will write less and less software in-house, I believe the, the SaaS will emerge uh, and it has to, I mean, that is the, the solution uh, to kill the complexity, I believe. Like we, we always talk about software all the time and we, we try to put this in the one band, like it's everybody's writing same kind of software and they have same kind of complexity and they have the end tiers and all that stuff. That's not true. Right. If you are Facebook, you're writing totally different kind of software. It needs to scale differently. It needs a lot of cash and all that stuff. Right. Cash like this and cash. Yeah. You know, yeah cash, cash as well. Yeah. Right. Both caches. Yeah. And, but but when you are a mid-sized enterprise out there in the like a flyover um, America, what uh, my friend Wayne says, like we need to think about those people too. Like how do they write software? What kind of software do they write? Like how many components they have in there? Like they have three tiers or four tiers. So I think they write a little more simpler software for internal use. We have to distinguish these applications. I, I always talk about this, like uh, the systems of record, systems of differentiation, the systems of innovation. And I think cloud will do great in the newer breed of applications because you're doing a lot of, a lot of experimentation. You're doing a lot of DevOps. You have two pizza teams and all that stuff, which is good stuff we talk about. But when you go to systems of record, you need stability. You need you need some things which is operational. You don't want to touch it again once it's in production, right? And so in between that that thing is, I think that's that's where the complexity lies. The systems are which are in between those systems of record and systems of innovation, which are very new greenfield. That that's what yeah. I think that's where we need to focus uh, our um, platform development. Um, platform as a service development, sort of uh, dollars, if you will, as an industry. I think Amazon is doing that that right, and and Azure is doing that right to a certain extent too. I I I, I worry a little bit about the uh, Google because they're more tilted towards the uh, data science uh, sort of side of things right now. Well, Microsoft has the most visibility into kind of the legacy world, but Rob, you're shaking your head there um, on his comment. Yeah, I. I, you know, I, What's your I watch the complexity of all these systems and, and, you know, I'm not sure that sassification of everything that we're doing is leading to less complexity It's pushing the complexity behind a curtain so that you, you, you can ignore the man behind the curtain. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, what we're really driving towards, and, and I think Amazon is accelerating this, the cloud is accelerating this, is a new set of standard operating processes and procedures based on automation, based on APIs, based on platforms uh, that ultimately I think people could own and could come back to how we want to operate. When I look at what we what we were just shown with, with the keynote, you know, it was and is things that application performance management and monitoring do. It's it's not really Amazon specific stuff. There's no magic beans that Amazon is growing operational knowledge, you know, in Amazon greenhouses that only they know how to consume. This is is actually pretty block and tackle stuff. Yeah. 
And most people don't need to operate it at that type of scale to be successful. Well, and well, the idea great, that I mean, it's a great point. I mean, let's let's pick up on that for the last couple of minutes we have left because I think that's a great, yeah. great double down. Because you think about the mantra, yeah, hey, everything is a service. You know, it's great for a business model. You know, you hand it over to the techies. They go, wait a minute, what does that actually mean? It's harder. But when I talk to people out there, and you, you hear people talk about everything as a service or satisfaction, I do agree. I think you're putting complexity behind the curtain, to, but it, it, it's kind of the depends answer. So if you're going to have everything as a service, the common thesis is it has to have support automation everywhere. You got to automate things to make things satisfied, which means you need five nines like factory type environments. And not true factories, but Rob, to your point, yeah. if you're going to make something a SaaS, it better be bulletproof. Because if you're, if you're automating something, it better be automated right. You can measure things all you want, but if it's not automated, like a, like a safe factory. And, and you have no idea what's going on behind the curtains with some of these, these things, right? Especially, you know, I know our business and you know our customers' businesses, they're, they're, they're reliant on more and more services. And you have no idea, you know, the persistence of that service, if they're going to break an API, if they're going to change things. A lot of the stuff that Amazon is adding here defensively is because they're constantly, you know, changing the wheels on the bus. Um, and that is not bad operational practice. You should be resilient to that. You should have processes that are able to be constantly updated and CI CD pipelines and you know continuous deployments. You shouldn't expect to, to you know fossilize your IT environment in Amber and then hope it doesn't have to change for 10 years. But at the same time, well, if you, the well, more control on, if you, you have, angle about the better. You know, it's DevOps, it's hypothetical, like a factory almost metaphor. Do you care if the cars are being shipped down the assembly line, the output works and the output, if you have self-healing and you have these kind of mechanisms, you know, you could have, do you care if the services are being terminated and stood up and reformed as long as the factory works, right? So again, it's, it's a complexity level of how much IT or you want to bite off and chew or make work. So to me, if, if it's automated, mm -hmm. it's simple. Did it work or not? And then the cost yeah. of work, so be, what's, your, what's your angle on this? Yeah. I believe if you believe in systems thinking, right? You have to believe in um, um, the concept of um, um, oh gosh, I'm losing over minor um, abstraction, right? So abstraction is your friend in software. Abstraction is your friend, anyways, right? That's how we human species actually make a lot of more progress than any other sort of living things here in this world. So that's why we are smart. We can abstract complexity behind the curtains, right? We we can we can keep improving, like from the the you know wooden cart to the car to the to the plane to the other. Like we 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 have this like we when when we see we are flying these airplanes, like ninety percent of the time they are on autopilot. Like that's hiding hiding of complexity. So abstractions right? is, is about evolution, evolvable software. A term he said. Yeah, um, no, that that is true. That <laughs> All is right, true. guys, we have one minute left. Um, Let's close this out real quick. Each of you give a closing statement on what you thought of the keynote and Werner's talk. Rob, we'll start with you. I, you know, as always, it's superb keynote. Uh, very different this year because it was so operationally focused and using the platform and, and helping people run their, their, off, their applications and software better. And I think it's an interesting turn that we've been waiting for for Amazon. Uh, to look at you know helping people use their own platform more, um, so a refreshing change and I think really powerful and well delivered. I, I really did like the setting. Great job and and, and we I found out today that Teresa Carlson is now running training and certification. So I'm in, I'm expecting that to be highly awesomely accelerated a success there. Sarvi, what's your take uh, real quick on uh, Bruner's talk, walk away keynote thoughts? I, I, I think it was what I expected it to be like, he focused on the more like a, the software architecture kind of discussion. And he focused this time a little more on the ops side than the dev side, which I think they they are pivoting a little bit uh, because they, they want to sell more AWS stuff to us, uh, to the existing enterprises. So I think um, that was uh, good. Uh, I wish at the end he said not only like go go build, but also go build and operate. So like yeah, they also go build, 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 but like who's going to operate this stuff, right? So I think um, 
uh, I, I will see a little more shift, I think, going forward. But we were talking earlier uh, during our watch party that I, th I think uh, going forward, uh, uh, AWS will open start open sourcing the commoditized version of their cloud, the, the, the services which have been commoditized by other vendors, and gradually they will open source it so they can keep the hold on to the enterprises. I think that's what my take is, that's my prediction is. Awesome, and I'll make sure I'm at your watch party next time. Sorry I missed it. Uh, <laughs> no worries. Taking notes, trying to prepare. Sabjeet, so, Rob, thanks for coming on and sharing awesome insight and expertise. Two experts in cloud and DevOps, I know them and can firstly vouch for their awesomeness. Thanks for coming on. I think Werner can verify what I thought already was reporting. Amazon everywhere. And if you connect the dots, this idea of reasoning, are we going to have smarter cloud? That's the next conversation. I'm John Furrier, your host of theCUBE here, trying to get smarter with AWS coverage. Thanks to Rob and Sarvi for coming on. Thanks for watching. Thank you.